Welcome to church this morning. It is Easter Sunday and we are so excited about what God is going to do today in our lives, in our church, and through us as we spread out to our community and share the love of Jesus with those people around us. What a great day to come together and worship. I wish we were doing it in person, but if we can't do it in person, at least we can kind of interact now. And so I encourage you right now on your computer, on your smartphone, go ahead and type in, hello, I'm here, glad to see you, that kind of stuff. Let us know that you're, that you're watching, that you're participating in worship. It will really help us out. I'm so excited for today. This is uh, the day of days in the church calendar. This is the day that every Sunday, all 52 weeks out of the year, we have a mini celebration of the fact that Christ is risen. But today, on Easter Sunday, we do it big and we do it right. And so I'm so excited. I want to teach you a little something. Normally, we'll, we'll say one thing, we'll pass the peace with each other, and we're still going to do that in a little bit. But Today is a special day, and there is a saying that has been going on for thousands of years, and I want to teach it to you in case you don't know it. I'm basically going to say, Christ is risen, and you're going to say, He is risen indeed. And I'm then going to say, and Christ will come again, and you're going to say, Amen. So, are you ready? Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, Christ is coming again. Amen. All right, let's try it. Here we go. Christ is risen. And Christ is coming again. Amen, indeed. We're so excited for what's going to happen over the next few minutes. Would you, wherever you are, clear out space in your living room or your bedroom, stand up. Let's get involved and join in as we worship and celebrate our risen Savior today.
tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the Well, in case you've been joining us online the last couple of weeks, but maybe you haven't been here for the past few months, I want to tell you about what um, is going on in the life of our church. We are going through something called Core 52, and we have been studying the 52 key principles in the Bible because we want to raise our biblical IQ. We understand that we are called to share our faith, and you can't share something you don't know. And so we have been on a quest this year to learn as much about the Bible as possible, to learn about the key um, overarching themes that are found throughout scriptures. Along with that, we've been memorizing scripture every week. And I'm so excited about how our church has embraced this. And we haven't done it the last couple of weeks and I apologize, but I wanna start doing it again. And if you came to a service a month ago, hopefully a month from now when we're back together, if you came to a service, you would hear 30 to 40, 
50, 55 people saying the same scripture that they memorized that week because we're all going through this together. And this Sunday on Resurrection Sunday, such an important verse that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so if you memorized it with us, say it with me. If you didn't, it's not too late. Memorize it later today. It's an easy verse. Thank you so much. If you want to join us in 452, I invite you to do it. You can go to our church website, ponaz.church, and you can click on the Core 52 link. You can see the past 15 um, core values and learn the memory verses and, and see um, Mark Moore, incredible author and speaker and pastor, give a summary of each week. And we invite you to join us because we're going to be continuing this for the next few weeks. As we continue in worship, we come to the time where we give back to God just a portion of what he's blessed us with. And so this is where we are collecting tithes and offerings. And so if you want to go ahead and pull out your smartphone or your laptop, um, the great way to give is online or by texting. Uh, if you prefer to mail in your offering, you can do that as well. Send it to our church address or you can drive by and put it in our offering baskets outside our sanctuary. But we give back to God, trusting that He is in control. And I know that in times like this, when we're dealing with a pandemic and scarcity seems to be uh, what most people are gravitating toward, that's not the way of the Christian. That's not the way of the disciple, because we understand that everything we have is God's. And so we continue to give faithfully so that the work of Christ can continue in our community. And so thank you for your generous and faithful giving. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for everything. God, I thank you for the way that you have been with our people. I thank you for the, the reports that we've heard of creative ways that people are reaching out and being your hands and feet. God, may your kingdom continue to advance even in these uncertain times because we understand that you are in control and that you love us completely. And so we choose to submit to you and give you control and love you completely in return. And we do that in part by trusting you with our finances. So as we give today, God, be glorified, be honored, and use our tithes and offerings to advance your name and to elevate your Son, our risen Savior. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples, peace I leave with you. And so it seems so fitting that during this time of the pandemic that we continue to pass the peace, trusting that everything is right between us and God and everything is right between each other. And so it is my joy on this Resurrection Sunday to say to you, may the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Would you take a moment on your um, social technology and get on your Google box and on the Facebook and the YouTube and will you type in peace be with you or peace to whoever it is, a brother, a sister, a family member, a neighbor that you know needs God's peace right now. Would you just take a moment and let's be the community and the body of Christ extending peace to each other at this moment.
pray with me our prayer for understanding? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So our first passage this morning is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen, and I will tell you where to get food that is good for the soul. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. I am ready to make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the mercies and unfailing love that I promised to David. He displayed my power by being my witness and a leader among the nations. You also will command the nations, and they will come running to obey, because I, the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the people turn from their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then over in the New Testament, we are in the epistle of, um, to the Colossian church. And here we'll be reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth, for you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, and when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Happy Easter, y'all. I know that this isn't what we expected our Easter to look like, and it certainly is okay for us to acknowledge that it feels strange and maybe even a little anticlimactic to be celebrating Easter in this way. Um, we're so accustomed to the big of Easter that I think it's understandably awkward for us to be celebrating it in a small way. But I do love the sentiment that kind of has floated around on social media this week that uh, this year, because we are in our homes, we are experiencing Easter in a way that's much more uh, closely related to how the original people celebrated the resurrection. There weren't any shopping sprees, new outfits, new shoes, no baskets of candy, or churches packed with friends and family. No. The first Easter was experienced by a small number of people in a very unexpected way when the good news broke through the silence of the morning. I believe, though, friends, that we need to back up a little. Yeah, we're definitely here to celebrate the resurrection. That is why we are here this morning. But today, I think it's really important for us to begin in 
may be an uncomfortable place. Actually, it's a place of grief. I'll start reading in Luke chapter 23, and I'll be reading verses 48 through 56, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. And when the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw all that happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching. Now, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he had been waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation for the Sabbath. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where they placed his body. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to embalm him. But by the time they were finished, it was the Sabbath. So they rested all that day as required by the law. Can we just spend a little time here? I think we typically rush over this part of the story and miss some of the achingly beautiful ways that the people who loved Jesus grieved. In, in the Greek, Scripture describes people beating their chests in profound grief as they went home after seeing Jesus die. But those who knew Jesus best, they stayed and they watched. And I imagine they just didn't want to believe that it was really over. They watched as Joseph carefully wrapped his body in linen, and then the women followed to see where he would be buried. After that, they left to prepare spices for his body. Now remember, this was the day before the Sabbath. It was a day of preparation. People would be busy preparing for the Sabbath, because the following day they would cease from all of their work and activities. All their preparations had to be done before sunset on Friday. The market would become quiet, and the darkness would usher in a hushed reverence. The women prepared the spices for Jesus' body, and they, then they had to wait. Because it was the Sabbath, there was nothing they could do to keep themselves busy. No meals they could prepare or long walks they could take. Imagine how they must have been aching. They had just seen their friend brutally murdered on a criminal's cross. They were traumatized by just how quickly it all happened. I mean, he was just celebrated. They could sense the excitement. They could imagine that Jesus was becoming all that they had hoped he would be. And in a matter of hours, it all ended. Their grief must have been just excruciating because it was the Sabbath. They couldn't go to work to, and distract themselves. All they could do was grieve. One of the beautiful things about this account of the death and resurrection of Jesus is that it acknowledges a profound sadness. And in it, it gives us permission to grieve. We aren't so good at that, though. We'd much rather do something to get our minds off of things. We want to rush to the next thing or a happier experience. And if you're anything like me, you take every opportunity to escape anything that feels painful or uncomfortable. But escaping our grief is only a quick fix. 
this passage shows us that sitting in the grief is part of the process. Right now, we are all inundated with news of death. Stories of the people who are dying are everywhere. The numbers of those who are sick and dying, they seem to be updated on an hourly basis. Now, we may not know someone who is sick or who has died, but we are indeed grieving. I think at some point we have to recognize that we as a global community are in pain. These days we are realizing our mortality and we are faced with some hard truths. Who have we become? What has defined us as individuals, as the church, as the global community? Friends, we are in desperate need of forgiveness. We're all grieving the loss of life as we knew it. We're grieving missed moments and events. I know for us, our girls are both in their last year at their schools, and so they're missing rites of passage and goodbyes. And we're staying in our homes, but we can only be distracted for so long. We can only watch so many shows on Netflix, and we can only bake so many cookies. And then for some, the time alone and the lack of busyness, it only intensifies the loneliness you are already feeling. And it may be having a significant impact on your mental and your emotional health. And still for others, there's nothing to keep you from thinking about that past hurt, maybe from your childhood or from that relationship. Maybe you thought things would be different than how they turned out. And maybe your heart is disappointed or broken this morning. Friends, today, even on Easter, you have permission to grieve. But there's more. In Luke 24, hear these words from the Gospel. But very early on Sunday morning, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside. So they went in, but they couldn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were puzzled, trying to think, what could have happened to it? Suddenly, two men appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed low before them. Then the men asked, Why are you looking in a tomb for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Don't you remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again the third day? Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Still grieving, these women made their journey to the tomb. This was not a walk of hopeful expectation. No, they were making their way to the tomb to actually embalm the body of their friend Jesus. I imagine they didn't want to waste time, but their steps certainly were filled with dread. I can't help thinking, though, that if the women had gone back to their daily tasks and made themselves busy with their lists, had they not taken the time to walk that road toward the tomb, an act of grief, they would have missed that experience of the resurrection. Now, much to their surprise and amazement, they found the stone rolled away and Jesus was not in the tomb. This was not what they expected to see. And rightfully so, they were terrified when the angels appeared to them. 
I mean, can you imagine the range of emotions that they had been feeling just in those moments? And I love that this is what the angels say to them. And this is from a different translation, but this is what they say. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Or why are you looking for the living among the dead? He isn't here. Of course he's not here. He has risen from the dead. It's at this point that the angels remind them of what Jesus told them in Galilee. I'm sure their minds were filled with all those times that Jesus had had spoken about his purpose. They just never imagined that it would look like this. And the women rushed back. The first messengers of the gospel. And they told the others the good news. This wasn't the end. It wasn't over. Jesus was alive. Now, more than any other part of this passage, one phrase has stayed with me so much this week. It's been brought to mind over and over and over again. And it's this. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Hmm. And I wonder where I am looking among the dead for life. In this passage, the angels ask them why they are looking for the living Jesus among those things that do not have life. And so I wonder, are you looking among dead things trying to find life? Are you looking for life among your checking account? Are you looking for life among your favorite politician? Are you looking for life among the likes you get on Instagram? Are you looking for life among the way that you look? Are you looking for life among the things you can buy or the fancy vacations or the car that you drive? Are you looking for life among feelings of importance, popularity, or success? Are you looking for life among your religion or the good old days? Are you looking for life among that grudge that you just can't let go. Let me tell you, friends, if you are looking for life and aren't looking to Jesus, you are looking for dead things. When we look for Jesus and when we look to Jesus, we become people of the resurrection. We become people who let the things of this world go because we know that life is only found in him. The angels reminded the women to think about what Jesus said and how he lived. And when they remembered, I imagine it was like an instant replay and their eyes were wide as they remembered these things. And when they remembered, they rushed to tell the others. It was true, all of it. They shared this crazy good news. They didn't keep that experience to themselves. They didn't worry whether or not people would think they were nuts. They didn't hesitate. They rushed to tell the others. In my mind, as I imagine this all happening, I I imagine that they dropped everything that they had in their hands and they hiked up their robes and that they took off and ran as fast as they could, maybe tripping over each other, just so excited to get back to their friends to tell them this good news. Nancy Claire Pittman sums it up beautifully. The boundless gift of the empty tomb cannot be separated from the words and actions of Jesus. Resurrection is not some buoyant ideal unconnected to the real world. 
It is an invitation to live as Jesus lived, a doorway to a life in which meals are shared with enemies, healing is offered to the hopeless, prophetic challenges are made to the powerful. Only now it is not Jesus who does these things. It is we ourselves who see at last the subversive power of the resurrection in order to live it now. On that, firm, on that first dim Easter morning when women cowered in the dust and angels picked them back up, pointing them out the door of a tomb into the full light of morning, the power of God was no longer unspoken. The silence was broken, and the women rushed back to tell others what they had seen. So, what have you seen Jesus do? How has knowing him changed you? How has he taken you from despair to joy? Rush to tell others. In fact, you could even start now here on social media. Share how you have been changed. What kind of new thing is Jesus doing in you? I'm not sure where you find yourself in this story, but let me assure you, if you are a person of the resurrection, your story doesn't end where you are today. As a person of the resurrection, your story is one of new life and purpose. Whether you need a new start, a restart, or a renewed purpose, today you can begin again. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we no longer have to look for the living among the dead. He is alive, and we can have a resurrected new life because of him. And that, my friends is the good news. Let's pray. Jesus, today we come to this place and we gather in our homes and we remember what you have done. We celebrate your resurrection and Jesus, we celebrate how you have resurrected us. Lord, I pray that anyone who may be watching or listening who has not made a decision to let you resurrect their lives, Lord, I pray that today will be their day. I pray for those who among us may just feel dead inside. God, I pray for new life and new beginnings. I pray for the new that you have promised. We know that you are a God of new things. And so today, Jesus, will you do a new thing in us? We love you. We celebrate you. And we are so grateful for the new life that we have because you live. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. We love you so much. Amen. Well, it has been a joy to worship with you today. And this is the part of our service that we come to and we celebrate um, through coming to the table. And we want to continue that practice because we understand that it is through the table. It is through the blood of Jesus that we are saved. And so I'm thankful that even though we can't do it together, we can still as one body proclaim that Christ is risen. And so I don't know if you made the bread that we suggested. Um, if you were part of our Wednesday email, you got a video that told you a great recipe that you could make for your own communion bread. Um, but if not, grab what's available and trust that God can transform it into something miraculous as he does all things. So on the night that our Lord was to be betrayed, he was gathered with his disciples in the upper room and they shared a meal together and Jesus was going off script all evening from the washing of his disciples' feet to changing the significance of things that had been 
traditionally held for thousands of years, Jesus was changing everything. And so at the point in the evening where he lifted up the bread, he lifted it up and he changed the liturgy and he said, this, this is my body which will be broken for you. Take, eat, and be thankful. And in the same way, when it came time to offer up the cup, I loved Friday evening as Pastor Pete reminded us, it would have been the third cup that he lifted up and it would have been the cup of redemption. And you've been delivered and redeemed, but I'm changing that. I am now the spotless lamb that is getting ready to die for you. Salvation and redemption is found in my blood alone. And so he held up the cup and he said, this is my blood which will be poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and be thankful. We truly are thankful, Father, that you loved us enough to send your Son. Jesus that you would love a sinner such as us. It's too wonderful for words, and we thank you. I pray that you will be with us, that as we take in this bread, as we take in this juice, in the same way, Lord, may we take you in. May you be part of our DNA. Jesus, take up residence in our lives. Holy Spirit, guide and direct us. Lead us to people so that we can remember and proclaim that we are different, we are transformed, we are changed because of the blood of Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. We sing hallelujah, let thy kingdom come. Let